is Gene Bessel with North Coast Sales Agency. Gene, it's always a pleasure to have you on board, uh, sir. And we are looking forward to the presentation today and, and getting an update on these uh, uh, new, new products and requirements. Uh, and I'll go ahead and give the uh, meeting to you uh, or to Brian, I guess. So, yep. Brian. All right. Well, um, thank you, everyone. And, and by the way, just on a side note, the ANSI 395.14 um, I guess members are meeting now as we speak on this issue. So there could be some new information by Friday, but just so you know, that is an ongoing program. They are physically meeting this week. So um, part of this is born out of uh, gentlemen in the industry and women. Um, when I go out, I know I have some of my colleagues, Jeff, I see Jeff and, and Justin, obviously from 3M. Um, I'm still running into people that have no idea there are some changes in ANSI coming. Um, and a little bit alarming. I know it is a manufacturer driven uh, program. You know, it's voluntary, but most of the manufacturers all drive that as a, a quality and to a standard that they try to achieve and or meet or exceed. So is that that being said, uh, it is voluntary, but here are some of the things which are coming down the pike. Okay. Brian, if you can advance that. All right, so a uh, couple of the big things here, we're simplifying the type and classes, um, increasing safety. Everything was measured at 282 pounds and tested is now going to 310 to bring it in line. Um, some new testing standards and standardizing on the labels, making them clear and actually requiring that they are part of the unit now in that shock pack instead of in the box, which everybody threw away with the cardboard and generally the tagline. Um, it's been around a while. Um, started June 17th. Um, currently, there is an effective date for manufacturers of February 1, 2023. Um, I do not know what ANSI that board is meeting this about if that will change, but currently that is the effective date for manufacturers to be shipping you product that meets this new standard if they are meeting the ANSI standards. A um, couple of things, big things, the class A and B, and most of us knew those from their additional um, distance in fall arrest, uh, those are now gone. Um, the SRLs, everything is being replaced with a class one and a class two. Go ahead. Um, peripheral, go ahead and flip that one, the next one. Sorry. All right. So on the back of these units, there's going to be a very clear box. If it is a class one device, it will be a white box with a black number one in it. Um, that is anchoring at or above your dorsal D-ring. Class two, opposite, black box, white letter two, that can be anchored from above you all the way down to five feet below D-ring. So this is a unit when you talk about um, leading edge, they're all going to be class two. So there should not be any confusion anymore about when you, an employee goes to grab something what you as a safety um, consultant or safety manager are going to spec to be used. It's pretty clear now, um, if the unit is down on the deck, if it has a one on it, that is not rated to be there, okay? So um, minimum arresting force under the old standard, you can see it was 1800 foot pounds. The average arresting fell under that or about 1350. Uh, the 900 foot pounds. And this is the big thing, gentlemen and ladies, that your additional descent on an A device was 24 inches, on a B device was 54. Everything now is moving to 42 inches. So if you have fall height that you have worked up for a unit, set an anchor, you need to make sure that you know that this unit or this measurement has now changed. Um, there were a lot of people using a class A device because of lower heights, lower anchors, and they were very happy and used that 24 inch. That is going away. Everything will be 42 inches. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, the testing of the units uh, previously was 282 pounds um, or 300. Now everything is standardized on two or 310. Um, static requirements, 3000, and it's going up to 3600. And for manufacturers, this posed challenges on the way the units locked up, the size of the unit, the poles, the teeth inside there. So there were a lot of changes that many manufacturers found that units that met the old requirement of 282 could not meet the 310 pound requirement. Okay. So um, as I said, ANSI is a voluntary consensus standard with no real enforcement. Um, there are certain industries, the refineries, some other people that go buy it and require all of that product to meet current ANSI. Uh, the military, as you know, they typically require uh, everyone to meet current ANSI. Um, this is a standard for your individual company to have a conversation about, find out where you want to be. Um, it is voluntary. There is no one that is going to come out and slap you on February 1st if you're still using an old unit. But also, you're kind of out on a limb if something happens and they start investigating it to the fact that the question is going to come up, why did you not update to a newer, safer, better unit when you had that opportunity? Um, and I guess I would say, and I would you know, ask either the 3M general if they want to pipe in, but um, we at Fall Tech recommend that if you're replacing units now, look at something that meets the new standard. Um, there is not a large price discrepancy. They have better features and it gets you just ahead of that standard and that consensus in the industry, what is a good safe place to be. But I do want to make the point that this is your company's individual um, decision and we'll leave it at that. And, and Gene, I'll pipe in real quick. Uh, Jeff Elliott with 3M Fall Protection. To Gene's point, uh, it is a voluntary measure, but we recommend as best practice that you do meet the ANSI uh, standard. That being said, after February 1st, 2023, any new products being purchased to meet that new standard have, has to go through that additional testing. So uh, any products purchased after February 1st, uh, to meet ANSI, we'll have to go through the new revision. So. so to Jeff's point, as a manufacturer, we can no longer ship you that product under that old standard. So, hey, right. I have a question real quick about this. Sure. Uh, so you're saying it's not enforceable, right? But uh, according to all the WAC codes, you know, well, let's say hard hats or uh, safety glasses, they always reference the ANSI standard and says uh, you're supposed to provide the equipment uh, that meets the, the standards of NC. So when you that, say that is, if, if nobody's going to go after this, technically they can, right? Well, ANSI is voluntary. And I think what you would find is if you had an a incident, an accident, um, and a manufacturer had stamped that they met these uh, manufacturing requirements and the, and the product failed, if we're all in court, um, that's going to be pretty big, and the manufacturer is going to have to prove that they met these to say they did. Um, but this clearly, ANSI is a manufacturer's guideline, which is voluntary. Most all of, to Jeff's point, most all of the manufacturers have standardized on it as a way of testing and to make sure we're all compliant. Um, for you guys, it is voluntary, but um, they're going to ask, why did you not take the uh, the accepted practice in industry and use that product when you knew it was available. Well, and I'm if, saying it's not voluntary. It's in the code that it says it's supposed to meet the standard. You, you, you don't have a choice. You're supposed to, when you provide PPE to uh, our employees, you're supposed to meet the standard. It, it is in the code for every uh, personal protective equipment. And, and products process. should be built to that standard. You're absolutely correct. Uh, but. My understanding, and, and Jeff, for, um, if you want to pipe in, uh, it is a voluntary standard that manufacturers all achieve and try to, but my understanding is it's still voluntary. 
Cor- correct. It is. This is Jeff again with 3M. It is a voluntary standard um, that us as a manufacturer strive to test to and exceed those testing requirements for safety reasons. Um, if there's an incident, uh, they're going to go back and see, you know, what obviously what units were being used. Uh, with the new standard coming in play, uh, effective February 1st, 2023, your current systems are still going to meet the previous revision of the ANSI standard and will still be safe to be used um, as long as they meet the manufacturer's criteria of pre-use inspection and then the, the formal inspection by the competent person. So I, I, I guess your question, um, my my information is in the chat room. Um, I would love to get you involved with our gentleman from Fall Tech that sits on the ANZ 359 board, and maybe he can help clear up some of your questions on that. But uh, I said, this is my understanding that, um, uh, and if there's an LNI person on, you know, on the call, please pipe in how you test or what you talk about ANZ. But the big thing is it's vol- it's, it's voluntary for us. We all strive to meet it. It's definitely voluntary for you because it's not really an end user standard. It's more of a manufacturing standard. All right. Um, here we talk about it. You know, um, expect that most customers um, are going to do a transition. And I, I would encourage you if you're currently buying product and you need to replace a product look at some product in the new standard. Uh, it's simply a, a better product, safer product, a little easier to read for your employees and your people because of the labeling. Um, but like I said, um, no one has to, to just point, go out on February 2nd and pull everything off a job site because it won't work. You know, that is not true, um, but it does need to be inspected to that new standard by the manufacturer and we cannot ship it to you, so. Um, any other questions on SRLs? All right, I guess let's uh, move on to hard hats or safety helmets. Um, a very hotly contested item right now in the Seattle market. Um, there are a number of large contractors that are starting to specify what should be worn on their sites and it's caused a lot of panic buying, a lot of confusion in the market. And I said, nice that uh, I got an opportunity to kind of get out in front and show you some of the stuff behind it you should be looking at, at least in my opinion. Um, so go ahead. Um, once again, your objectives, um, and I'm not gonna read every slide to you where we can read, but um, increasing worker safety, you know, comfort breeds compliance was always the kind of saying in the industry. Um, that they meet some OSHA standards. And the big thing probably is uh, prevent traumatic brain injury, which comes from a very sharp impact uh, to our heads. Okay. Um, Interesting that this is an evolution process. Um, So 1919, they started, you know, a little history. 1946, you know, metal was introduced in 62. polycarbonate, plastics, fiber was introduced. So they're over 15 years old, or excuse me, 50 years old. Um, I would encourage you guys to look at this and gals as evolution. Um, Our steel-toed boots have gotten better. We now have composite. Um, Our high-vis has gotten better. Our gloves, um, many of you remember when leather was used, we really didn't have a lot of cut-resistant gloves. Now, you know, a three or a four of the standard in our market. Um, glasses have gotten better. Harnesses have gotten way better than they used to be 50 years ago. So it is evolution. And it's kind of interesting that the most important part of your body, our head, we're still protecting with technology that was really from 1962, um, you know, over 50 years old. Okay. Um, current hard hat, um, I would say not everyone has to have a safety helmet, but you need to look at your needs and um, what injuries they could uh, sustain or what hazards they have. Um, You have the typical polycarbonate hard hat so that hasn't changed. 
And as you can see, or as you know, um, safety helmets are coming into play. Um, typically they come with chin straps. Um, some are magnetic, some are a clip, kind of depends on some of the standards they're meeting. They have a shock absorbing um, foam inside of them. So it absorbs that impact instead of transferring it straight to your head like a hard hat would. And they have an integrated protection system. So there's headgear, um, the foam, and then a helmet all work together to lessen that impact from a slip trip or a fall or in a fall arrest situation. Okay. Um, right now, um, thanks to tethering tools, uh, we've done a really good job of not dropping stuff on people anymore, which was the primary reason the hard hat came out or was invented. Um, a majority of the industries now are slips, trips, and falls, either on a site or a swing fall and fall protection. So different features, you know, looking at your helmet, um, please roll them over and look inside. That's where most of the story can be told. Um, what kind of chin strap, you know, does it have all around head protection? Is it rated for front side, back and top impact? Um, are there accessories? You know, can you put hearing protection on it? Can you put a ANSI approved uh, face shield on it? Can you put a wire shield if you're grinding? You know, something like that. Um, does it have a liner or how does it mitigate that impact to your head? And then the other thing, is it vented? And please remember, venting cannot be used in an electrical application, but they are available for uh, many manufacturers have vented helmets for people that are not in an electrical application. Gene, I have a question. Sure. Question. And you might you might be talking about this here in a moment, but uh, as far as uh, the suspension trauma uh, uh, gear on the the insides, can these be replaced uh, in the actual shell itself, or is the whole bonnet going to be uh, replaced at a certain uh, expiration date? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of those. I will talk about that in just a second, but um, I can speak for two manufacturers I deal with, Cask primarily. Um, if there is damage to a strap, a chin strap, something like that, it does need to be replaced at the factory, being that it's an integral part. Um, cask does not allow that chin strap to be removed, so it can't be, re quote, replaced in the field or taken off. Um, but many helmets do have warranties, and uh, they can be repaired typically at a factory level. Okay. All right, um, big thing here. Um, most all of your hard hats, as you know, are a five year uh, product life, one year typically on the headband the structure inside needs to be replaced. I will say I got I stopped asking people on job site trainings how old their hard hats are because it makes the safety guy real uncomfortable when he starts hearing that um, safety hard hats are three, five, seven, nine, ten 10 years old or older. Um, the newer safety helmets generally comply with that ANSI standard um, to top, front, back, and side impact. And then they are also designed in fall protection or heavy impacts uh, to stay on the head. And many safety helmets have either three, five, or 10 year shelf lives. Many come with one, three, or uh, year warranties. So it is a longer lasting product and can stay in service longer than your traditional hard hat. Okay. So this is where a lot of the confusion is coming in. Um, they're type one and type two, and then different classes. So obviously your traditional out of the box polycarbonate hard hat is a type one. The safety helmets with padding inside that dampens the impact, those are typically meeting your type two under ANSI. And then your different classes, a G is general, E is an electrical, and C conductive, which don't get into a lot of those. But the big point is you cannot have a vented hard hat in an electrical application. Okay. Um, so type one helmets really meant for a direct impact on top of the head with penetration, 
some FR and electrical. A type two is a lateral impact, lateral penetration, and then chin strap requirements, and then a lower and higher temperature range. But the top things there is that uh, type two gives you that lateral style impact um, and penetration uh, protection against a type one. Okay. Um, enter the European standard, which um, a number of manufacturers have dual labeled product. They meet both the EN 12492 standard um, and the type two standard. Um, these are different standards and I'll kind of go through this briefly here in a second, but um, they focus, the EN standard focuses more on front side back lateral impact uh, than a class one or a class two. Um, and there's several tests you'll see in a second for even for chin strap retention, both from a front impact or a back impact, you know, does that helmet stay on? Um, and the EN standard, um, good roll over here. That's fine. Um, eight, there are eight clauses within EN. Um, this is where it's a bit confusing because there are manufacturers that will say they meet EN 12492 and they can meet part of these, all of these. So uh, you really need to do some checking on the helmet that you're looking at to see if they meet all eight of these clauses or not when they see the EN standard. Uh, because EN will allow someone with minimal number of clauses to still say they're rated to the EN 12492. Um, go ahead. So um, this was taken Monday directly off websites. So if there have been changes I don't know about, I guess I will say please check current product. But this is the latest information I got where four of the different manufacturers here, which standards they meet within that EN standard. Um, I won't pick on number three, but you can see they meet a couple of partial standards. And if you look up above, that could be a front, lateral, rear, and penetration. So what you wanna be looking at, if you have people that are working at height, you know, that live in a harness, your hazards are different than someone's just walking around or the flooring guy I talked to that uh, lays flooring down. Um, so please be aware that there are different parts of this EN standard that a manufacturer can meet and they can still say they meet the EN standard. Um, differences here, and I guess I'll say that um, Rhett and the guys here at SMART do a good job of putting this up if you'd like to read this more in detail but there are significant differences between the EN standard and top of impact. An example, EN is 11 pounds, where ANSI is only eight. Uh, EN is a fall height of six and a half feet, where uh, ANSI's uh, five and a quarter. So there are different standards and they do have um, very good reliability or accountability in the industry if you have those hazards. You want to look and make sure you're getting the best product to your people that you can. But there's a small chart there that shows the differences between those or the comparison between um, EN, ANSI type one and ANSI type two. Um, top impact, uh, like I said, this is uh, different in weight here, um, but they both do uh, directly on the top. And uh, you can see the test measurements there between an EN and a type one. So for a top impact, EN is a much more rigorous or a tougher standard to meet. Okay. Um, once again, the same thing between EN, ANSI 1 and 2 uh, for top penetration, off-center penetration. Um, just a matter of the way it is tested and the weight that is done. Okay. Um, retention. And this is a big thing. Um, will your hard hat stay on during a swing fall, during an event or not? So part of the EN standard is retention system in strength and a retention system in effectiveness. Okay. So retention system strength 
Uh, this just talks about um, the kind of weight that's put on it with no breakage, and so it will stay on. Um, equivalent of 110 pounds is pressed onto that to make sure that stays on and physically will not break or come off. Okay. And then there's also effectiveness. And this is done from pulling the backside of the helmet to make sure that once again, if there's some sort of a swing fall, there's an impact to the back of the helmet. Once again, this helmet stays on. It's called a roll off test. And you can see it can only rotate to a certain degree before it to meet this test. And by the way, this is not a test that ANSI does require. Um, Understand that was a lot of information fairly quickly. Um, I said, uh, I know the guys put this up on their site that you can download it and take a look at it. Um, I guess I'd open it now if there's any specific questions or any discussion. I actually have a question, uh, Gene. You know, it might be a, a little bit of a loaded question or, or multiple questions is, you know, there's been some talk of uh, amongst us, the government officials, that this may become a requirement uh, for certain trades or even industry wide. And we have seen uh, many uh, of the larger general contractors in our area, uh, speaking of the Greater Puget Sound, uh, transition into the uh, side impact rated hard hats. Now, uh, with that being said, one would uh, assume or uh, hypothesize that uh, in the event of a fall, the first thing to come off is probably going to be your hard hat. And unless you do a swan dive or go head first, that the last thing that's going to hit is your head because of the whiplash motion and the weakness in the neck muscles. Uh, has there been any talk that you have heard about about uh, labor and industries or even OSHA exploring this for people who might be working at heights or might be exposed to a side impact hazard? Um, I guess I will follow that up with um, yes. I know that OSHA is looking at that. Um, I also know that many of your, as you alluded to, the top people in the industry are, are mandating this and have put out letters specifying which products can be on their sites. Um, and they are doing away with your traditional hard hat because of that liability. Um, Turner, Clark, uh, have both have letters out that have been pretty uh, well distributed. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, most all of your big guys are headed this way to protect their employees because this is best practice. And I do think right, you will see that the, the governmental agencies will get involved and start to say that there's a significant hazard with fall deaths or traumatic brain injury that can be reduced or mitigated by wearing this type of product. So you're going to see stronger legislation probably coming out as we're trying to protect our workers sometimes against their will, but we're trying to protect them. Same thing we do at fall protection. You know, you're required to wear product. And I think that's what you're gonna see here in the coming years. Um, I, Jeff, is, uh, do you see anything or have you heard anything from 3M's perspective? Uh, I'm gonna pass that on to Justin that handles uh, our head, eye, and face. Sorry, Gene, what the question was, have we heard anything well, about this becoming legislation? Well, just um, yes, I guess. Are we is there going to be a tightening of the rules or regulations on head protection? Gene, I really haven't heard those rumblings. Um, and, and to be quite frank, I'm not sure what goes on in Iowa or Kansas City or Boston. I mean, I know that this market um, has really taken off. With the acceptance of this helmet but i i would be interested in anybody's perspective if they're doing this in chicago or if this is unique to the west coast um i guess i, I could say from a cask perspective um this is a pretty dominant field across the u.s and most all of the big contractors um, are getting involved and are starting to specify this type of helmet uh, on their job sites. And from our perspective, we don't see within three to five years that you'll be able to get on a job site probably without one of these from a liability perspective. Fascinating, thank you.
Any other questions for Gene uh, regarding SRLs or the uh, new hard hat technology that's uh, coming down the chute? Um, sounds like uh, um, uh, a good uh, good thing to look at internally uh, if your organization hasn't already uh, to start looking at uh, costs, um, et cetera, and uh, different styles of product that are out there. I know there's a variety of products, as Gene mentioned, but is there any questions on SRLs or hard hat or head protection? Yeah, I got a question for you. Um, my name's Joseph. Uh, it's about the hard hats. The um, In my industry, which is interior, exterior systems, steel studs and such, we got welders. So this could even extend as a question for like iron workers in terms of how these rating systems have been working out for the new safety helmets. Since there's a lot of various materials I see packed on the inside there. So addressing the concerns of flammability would you have anything to add um i cask as a manufacturer does make an fr model um it goes into some of your welding you talk about or the electrical from an arc flash so yes there are manufacturers that have this type of helmet which is um, rated to the fr standard um i'm not sure how many but i said i know that uh the, the cast does have one I can't speak to the other guys, but uh, yes, that is being addressed. There are a number of different flip visors for welding that can now be attached onto these helmets. So if somebody's doing some welding, they don't have to go get a complete another helmet or something like that. They can have a, a flip visor, an accessory put on it. Uh, but they are addressing the the steel, the welding in that industry also. Dan uh, Cabot, I believe you have a question Hello. as well, please. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, hey, regarding the, the new helmets, uh, you know, we, we're a subcontractor that uh, has one of our contractors now is going to require yeah, everyone to, to I was, switch I'm not over. Doing super well, so I'm at home uh, working from home today, but do you need me to drop it off? Hey, just a quick question for everybody uh, on board today. Make sure that you have your microphone muted. We got some background <laughs> noise uh, coming yeah. in. So uh, we are sorry to hear that you're sick, but please, please mute. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what that was. Um, anyway, one of our contractors is requiring all subcontractors to switch over to the new uh, helmet style with with certain of these um, clauses uh, required. Um, so we're starting to head down this road. My question is, uh, when most of these uh, are only type one at this point, and when do you think uh, the general uh, assortment of helmets are going to be type two? Because I, I hate to have a, a switch over, you know, 100, 150 hel helmets as type one, and then all of a sudden the type two requirement comes out and everybody switches to that. You see that coming well, anytime soon? Well, um. Dan, actually, most all of your safety helmets are already a Type 2 or an EN. And um, I can speak from the ones that I flashed up earlier. Um, so to have that chin strap retention, that impact, all that, that is a Type 2 standard. So um, everything, so I know the four competitors I put up, they all have product that are Type 2, ANSI, and meet the EN standard also. So they are readily available in, in the market. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic. Hey, I don't mean to uh, call you out, but I'm going to anyway. Brandon uh, with Turner Construction, I know that, that your team has been uh, very diligent and has had implementation of this uh, over the past year or more and is now rolling out a requirement for subcontractors. Can you speak to the effectiveness of these hard hats and feedback from your personnel in the field on how they are liking this uh, uh, these new style of bonnets? Yeah, so. Um, for the most part, they're lighter and people find them comfortable. I think the only complaint I've had is they get hot in the summertime because of the foam liner on the inside. And then from the subcontractor point of view, um, they were having trouble with availability, um, being able to buy these in bulk for their um, for their workers. So that's one of the complaints we're getting right now is, is finding the right one. But for the most part, everybody's wearing them. Everybody's wearing the chin strap. Um, all the elevated work we do on lifts and ladders and you know up on leading edges you know everybody's happy to wear it so nothing no pushback at this point thank you sir any other questions for gene 
or any other uh, discussion revolving this. Yeah, can I just ask, uh, what's the big difference if you put a chin strap on a hard hat compared to the safety helmet? I've already been asked the question and I just want to get another perspective. Um, sure. So the big thing about trying to put a chin strap you know, on a existing regular hard hat, um, that structure really does not support that very well. And you have to really tighten it down quite tight to make it stay on because there's there's no real structure. And as you know, that headgear kind of all moves um, and it's not very comfortable. Um, that was the first Band-Aid that a lot of people did is require chin straps and workers don't like them. They, they itch, they, they put a lot of pressure on their head and um, still during a fall, that is still going to allow your head to move to the side, front or back, press your head up against through that structure to the plastic and have that impact be directly you know, to your head. Um, we're in a safety helmet to um, our friends from Turner's point that they are warmer because your head is now encapsulated by foam dampening that impact. So um, one, we found chin straps on helmets just did not fare well because the employee had taken off the minute he walked through, you know, or past the safety guy because it wasn't very um, effective or um, comfortable. Um, and the helmet solves a lot of that problem being it's more encapsulated like in a race car, a hockey helmet, a football helmet, something like that. But the downside is it's direct contact with your head. We're used to having some air up there. And so to the point, it is a little warmer um, and because of that direct contact. Very interesting. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Oh, hey, Russ. Oh, go ahead. Cindy, please. Just Cindy with National Safety. I just wanted to encourage you guys to reach out to your distributors because we have samples, we have, you know, relationships with our manufacturers and we can get you the information and, and, and you know, we can help you with this process. So, so reach out to us. There's a few of us on the call and that's, that's what we do. So, yeah, absolutely. Use your local resources and folks. It might be something to to look at putting your supervisors or your leads uh, in these for a test run to see how, how it works. And once you have buy in from the foreman, supervisors, leads, whoever's on site, it might be much easier to roll out if they see their their leads uh, utilizing this equipment and understand its effectiveness and the purpose thereof. So question again. Uh, so that begs the question. What's price going on these? I mean, I know price was a big feature, a big driver, number one, but number two, um, can you get uh, custom ordered as in logos and things like that? Um, yes, I guess um, there's, like I said, there's a number of distributors online they can tell you, but pricing, uh, but yes, you can customize these. Um, on a cask helmet, there are seven different spots I can put, you know, a some sort of a logo and you know our boys from Turner should know this. So there's anybody from Skanska, um, Clark, um, you know, front, back, side. You can put all sorts of different verbiage, logos, things like that. We just ordered 600 from Stutson, and all the questions that you guys had, um, our guys are struggling with too. They're trying to put their hoodies up there. They don't want to do the strap. They, they don't fit right, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to take time. Um, we found very quickly that, you know, drywall industry for us is very, very stubborn. But I do like that point you brought up about, um, you know, the technology that we have been running with is 50 years old. So I, I love that. I'm going to sell that to the guys. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point to bring up uh, uh, being a uh, past college football player and, and watching the transition, which everybody has probably seen of the the heart well, going from wearing no hard or helmets, then progressing on throughout the decades of getting better and better and focusing more on the uh, CTE syndrome and concussion protocol and head trauma. I mean, it's it's really become much more advanced and there's no reason the construction industry uh, or any industry should not be following suit. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead. One more question again. Um, so we are we're going to these uh, slowly but surely. Um, you know, it, it would have prevented at least two or three recordables for us down in our Gulf Coast region. Um, 
so we're kind of doing a slow rollout here. One question though, are guys like the full brim hard hats to keep the rain from going down your car collar? Can mm -hmm. these even come in full brim with that side impact testing? Are there any full brim options or is that never going to come because of the test? Um, well, I, I guess once again, I can speak for one manufacturer, Cask. They do have accessories that give you a ball cap style uh, front brim very easily to go on it. But to your point, some of that problem is, is um, when you strike an impact, you don't want that hard hat being forced or help being forced away from your head by that lip. Um, I think up, that's some um, of the problem you find. Look up Wave Cell. They have a full brim hard hat um, that they make that's type two and class E and G. Wave Cell? Wave Cell, I believe it. W-A-V-E-C-E-L-L. -E -E uh, they, they were at ASSP, um, I think in May, whenever we were at Ellensburg. They, they make a full brim uh, type two. They were supposed to send me a sample. They never did, but. I yeah, have they're, a they're out of I have a pamphlet. If, let me see if I can find their email their uh, website real quick. Excellent. This has been a great discussion. Is there any additional questions, comments, rumors, outright lies? We'd like to hear it. One. All right. One, who wants to give a yes, please. Next? 